So I'm Preston Parker. Uh, I've been involved in uh, open educational uh, projects and things for uh, 10 years now. I just thought it was 2001. So uh, I, I got involved in uh, open courseware uh, kind of uh, early on uh, and got me interested in a few uh, things about uh, why faculty, why instructors would be interested in even doing this. Uh, I was, at the very beginning, uh, I was helping Utah State University with their open courseware project and I had the uh, wonderful responsibility of recruiting faculty because nobody knew about open courseware at the time. So I got to go around and be a, an evangelizer, basically. I already believed in the premise behind open courseware and OERs, even though they weren't really called that at the time. Uh, but this idea of open licensing, educational materials, get them out to the world, quality will go up, and ac accessibility will increase, and it's going to be a great thing, right? Well, I soon found out that instructors did not have a clue what I was talking about to begin with. And not only that, the number one question I would get is, What's in it for me? They were all dialed into WIIFM. What's in it for me? And I had to start thinking of answers to that question because to be able to have faculty that are going to contribute their materials to the USU Open Courseware project, uh, we, we had to have buy-in. And that was one of my responsibilities, is to sit down with faculty and talk them through the process. And they all would say, well, why would I want to do this? What's in it for me? And I would say, well, uh, you could get your material out there and people would discover you and maybe you would get increased networking opportunities or maybe you could collaborate with other people and you could get grants. And I found that I was just coming up with hypotheticals, that there wasn't really any data to back up what I was saying. So I thought, well, someone's got to do a study on this to figure out what are the real benefits and conversely the costs of contributing to open courseware. And that person turned out to be me. Nobody else was doing it. The, the reason was, <coughs> excuse me, the reason was is a lot of people cared about at the time the institution. Well, what does the institution get out of it? What does Massachusetts Institute of Technology get out of it? What does Utah State University get out of it? Why would they want to be involved in this giant project that's going to take millions of dollars to get it going? Why would the institution want to do this? And a lot of individuals were looking at the users, saying, well, what about those that are accessing the materials, the open courseware, the open educational resources? What about the users? What are they benefiting? How does it benefit them? And what is the cost for them? Okay. But nobody was looking at instructors. And to me, that was the most interesting, because if the instructors weren't doing it, there wouldn't be any OERs, in my opinion. They would have to see the costs and the benefits, and if the benefits outweigh the costs, they, they would contribute their materials in the form of lecture notes and PowerPoints and examples of student work and exams and all of that that we're familiar with now. But they had to see that the benefits outweighed the costs. And as I talked with some of the instructors at MIT, they would say things like, well, there's this that's good and this that's bad. Like, I, don't, I want to document this. This is getting really interesting. I want to document this. Well, it took until about 2005, 2006, and I did a pilot study with um, Utah State University, test out my instruments and things, and then I was ready to, <coughs> excuse me, I was ready to uh, put the study together uh, to have MIT as my case. I'm a qualitative researcher, not because I'm frightened of numbers. I, I have a math minor. I, I get it. But it's just not interesting to me. I think the stories and the quotes and sitting down with someone and interviewing them, that's just really interesting to me. That's what I wanted to capture. So I did a qualitative case study uh, with, uh, with MIT as, uh, as the case. They were the oldest uh, open courseware. Uh, and they're the ones that I wanted access to. So I went out to Cambridge and met with some faculty and kind of tested things out, what I wanted to do. We decided, well, video 
Uh, video would be enough, or phone interviews would be enough. I wouldn't have to go face to face or do a focus group or anything like that. Just do the, the interviews. <clears throat> Through working with the uh, MIT team, I got access to the, the raw data and the reports uh, for 2003, 2005, and 2009, which included surveys that they did and interviews that they did, uh, which kind of formed the foundation of, of, of my study. And then uh, I got access to thousands of online feedback comments, which was nice because they said, you know, this is all qualitative and nobody's ever even looked at it really. We've picked out a few here and there, but we'd love for someone to go through all of them. So they just turned them all over in an Excel document to me from like 2003 on. So I had about five years worth of, of these online feedback comments of just people going to the MIT OCW site and submitting feedback. A lot of it had to do with students, and I just threw that aside. But anything that was instructors, I identified that, that it's instructors giving feedback. That's what I wanted to look at. Uh, and then I did the, the phone interviews. Uh, so the findings, there's seven benefits and six costs that I've identified and categorized them uh, after, after going through coding them. <coughs> Number one benefit, they perceived that their reputation increased. Uh, now, to be clear on this, they talked about the institution reputation increasing and maybe their college or school or department reputation increasing. But they were uh, specific in pointing out that if that increased, they felt as individual instructors, their reputation increased as well. So that kind of got all categorized together. This was one of the quotes, uh, tremendous positive attention to MIT from all over the world enhanced our reputation. So increased reputation was important to them and perceived as a benefit. Uh, networking, now this was something that I thought and I used when I was trying to recruit faculty and instructors to do uh, Utah State University's open courseware and I thought it would increase networking. I actually thought it would increase a little bit more than what MIT reported. Although they reported it, I thought it would be one of the bigger uh, benefits. Uh, and it wasn't one of the bigger ones. Only a few faculty mentioned it here and there. But the ones that mentioned it, it was something important to them. And this this uh, particular faculty, she said, there's two or three emails a week from people who say they saw, saw her materials uh, on OpenCourseWare. Uh, this is an important part here, is they would not have otherwise heard from these people. It was because of taking their materials, putting them in an OpenCourseWare environment, that they were discovered. They wouldn't have met these people otherwise. Or maybe they would have met them but two or three years down the road or at a conference or something else. But this facilitated an earlier meeting networking opportunity. Uh, supplementary opportunities. Now this could be uh, book publishing. Uh, this could be the grant writing. This, these supplementary things that came about uh, became a category. And this quote was talking about a textbook. And there were several, uh, several uh, quotes about textbooks, uh, which has become uh, become one of the bigger topics in OER, as we've seen in this conference, is textbooks. And how does that factor into all of this? Uh, but getting uh, feedback uh, from the masses and from publishers, they got copy editing feedback on their textbook that they put in MIT OpenCourseWare. They put it up there. Some of them contacted the publisher ahead of time and said, you know what, I know we got a deal going on. Uh, can I put this in an open environment? Not one of them said the publisher frowned on this. In fact, I had several quotes that said the publisher actually encouraged it, recognizing that if it was out there, people would become more aware of it, and they would still buy the book. That surprised me. I didn't think publishers would be okay with that. But I, some, of the, some of those that responded said that they didn't have any problems with publishers. So. Uh, improved course content. Now, this was one of the underlying concepts of open course where if you put it out there and it's public, then the quality goes up for two specific reasons. One, you're going to have a lot of people looking at it and you want to put your best quality work up there so you spend a little extra time on it. And two, because there's a lot of people looking at it, they're giving you feedback, mistakes and uh, suggestions, and then you improve it. <coughs> I uh, received periodic feedback, questions, suggestions for improvement. Pretty typical type of a quote that I got on that uh, benefit. Uh, and that's course content. Now, course feedback. This is interesting. I didn't even think of this one. 
students who had taken the face-to-face -face course would go into open courseware and offer feedback to the instructor on the course that they had just taken or that they had taken before. Like, hey, what I liked about your course was directly to the instructor, they're offering this feedback on the course, not the content, but the course experience. And so instructors that saw it as a benefit that, oh, I'm getting feedback on my course through open courseware. Interesting benefit. Uh, students accessing the materials. Now you'll see uh, some of these have parallels in the costs. There's a benefit and a cost, and this is one of them, having the materials out there uh, publicly. Students accessing the materials um, was nice because instructors, uh, it's an open environment. So if students can access the materials, there's a lot of benefits that come out of this. Uh, one, for example, if after the course they want to get access to those materials, the instructor doesn't have to deal with Oh, I got an email from the former student that wants that handout that they lost, that I gave to them, that I do have on PDF, that I have to go find in a folder and attach to the email and respond to it. Instead, if a student contacts them, they just say, oh, here's the link. It's in the OpenCourseWare uh, site for that particular course. Just go get it yourself. Or the students already know that it's available in OpenCourseWare. They don't even have to contact the instructor. Uh, another thing is it's a recruiting tool. Uh, the inst instructors mention that Students found the materials online beforehand, and then they would sign up for the course. A few instructors mentioned they saw an increase uh, in, in their, uh, in their uh, enrollments. And they felt it had something to do, not strong, but something to do with having their materials out there for students to see. And this is a, a benefit working with the OCW, uh, the MIT OCW team. Uh, some of them thought it was a great thing. It was a, it was a nice experience to work with the team and to think about their materials and to get it put up. Now, I hadn't even thought of this as being as a benefit ahead of time. I was a little uh, surprised that it was mentioned, but there it is. All right, then the costs. As I said, there's parallels. Some instructors mentioned that it, they felt their, their reputation was damaged by having their materials out there. A lot of this had to do with not being able to update, update the materials easily because a lot of them are PDFs. And, and MIT's philosophy is we do an instance. So that's spring 2005, the instance of that course. If you want to do an update, well, then we'll do another instance. We'll do a spring 2006 version of that course. Going back and updating the materials was not part of the philosophy. And that was the choice MIT or OCW made. And instructors had a hard time with that because then their materials got out of date over a period of time, and they felt their reputation was damaged because they had out-of-date materials there. Okay? Uh, or um, fair use concerns, uh, which is <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is the materials had to be cleared for IP. Right? This is open licensed materials, so if they include an educational fair use uh, image or text or something, they couldn't have it here because it's not a password protected environment. Okay? So if you take that out and you take what's left, it's a skeleton of what they felt their materials really were. So they felt their, their reputation was damaged. Because uh, you had to replace that image with another image that is, uh, that is available or IP cleared, or they had to recreate the image and the instructors had to go through the process of approving that recreated image, things like that. Lots of intellectual property rights. A few, fact, uh, a few instructors mentioned that they found their materials being used improperly outside of the open license. That they'd have to monitor this and police this, and they didn't like that. They felt like they were losing some of their uh, rights to, to duplicate and distribute and make alterations and exhibit their materials, the copyrights. They didn't like the extra resources. Mostly time that it took to clear things like fair use, to communicate with that MIT OCW team. Um, so this instructor mentioned it's a hassle in vetting the OCW substitutes. That's the images that replace the fair use. It just took extra time. This is one I hadn't thought of uh, before, uh, before this study, is there were faculty that felt pressured mostly by their department administrators. 
department heads, etc. They felt pressure that they had to do this initiative. They didn't like that. It's a cost. It is they had to realign their goals with what the department saw as being important. Okay? This individual, I'm only involved because I was harassed endless, endlessly. Earlier on, he mentioned that it was the department head. Harassed endlessly by the department head. Uh, enough trouble getting students to come to class without uh, lectures online. So another, another concern is, uh, and this actually folds into the, the next one, is the materials are public. I have enough trouble getting my students to come to class without the materials being online. They can see the materials, so now they don't feel like they need to come to class. So my enrollments might be up a little bit, but the attendance is actually down a little bit because the materials are out there. Okay? Oh, another thing about public materials, uh, and that's what the second quote is here, uh, it has made me reluctant to put information that might be questioned by a colleague on a handout. Specifically speaking about a handout that this instructor is putting in MIT OCW. So it's like, if you're if it's going to be questioned, I'm, I'd rather just not put it there. So it actually could cause quality to go down a little bit because you're hesitant in putting something out there that you don't feel is completely uh, whatever, completely legit, completely honest, completely factual, completely fitting in with the lesson materials because you're going to be challenged by, by colleagues. Okay? So benefit and the cost. Having it out there to be challenged to find mistakes and things. Some see it as a benefit, the content goes up. Some see it as a negative, a cost, because they're being challenged and they don't like it. Okay? And then the last cost, which is parallel to the benefit, working with the MIT OCW team. Uh, a representative quote, I found the emails, the interactions with the OCW folks somewhat offensive. Okay, there were some times some friction uh, would exist between the MIT OCW team and the instructors that were working uh, with putting their materials on MIT OCW. All right, so, so what, you know? And my interest in this all along and from the beginning is a much bigger picture, much, much bigger outlook on things, uh, which is if content creators see a benefit for putting open licensing on their content, they'll adopt the open licenses and then, as uh, at least the, the American copyright law says, it will make progress in useful arts and sciences. We're not protecting the copyright holders. That's not the point of copyright law. The point of copyright law is the progress of useful arts and sciences. Because okay, so if we can put open licensing on it, and we see the benefit for, in essence, giving our materials away, okay, then things can progress. Quality can go up, accessibility can go up, and all of that. So, Quite frankly, if you take this to the logical end, what you come up with was, is if the product can be duplicated digitally, the business models of making money directly from selling it are disappearing. My opinion is they're not going to be around long at all. Business models of selling anything that can be duplicated digitally will disappear. You've got to find a way of making money of having a business model around the digital content that doesn't involve selling that digital content directly. It's too hard to police the copyright, for one. Okay? For two, users don't want to have to deal with content that they have to worry about copyright. They just want to be able to copy it, download it, and not worry about the Department of Justice coming after them for five years imprisonment and $250,000 fines per infringement. They, don't, they want to not have to worry about that. They want open content. Okay? I was explaining this to my students as we were at a conference last week at Universal Studios. The conference was actually in Orlando, but we took a little leadership excursion to Universal Studios. We did a little team building. And quite frankly, it was a great team building session. And as we're walking along, some of them are saying, so what's your research in? What do you think about? What do you, like, open licensing. This is just like, it's, I think about it every day and where we're headed. And like, what does that mean? So I'm explaining it to them. These are undergraduate students in uh, mass communications. And, and I said, well, we're at Universal Studios. Look around. There's Jurassic Park land, and there's Dr. Seuss land, and there's Harry Potter world, and this is what I'm talking about. Right here. You give your movie away, so Paramount and Universal and whoever else, 
box. The studios don't make money on selling anything that can be digitized. They make money on people going out to the movie theater, sitting down with popcorn, with a room full of people that have never seen the movie before, and it's an experience that can't be duplicated digitally. And I hadn't thought of it before, but walking around Universal Studios, one of my students says, well then this is what you're talking about. It's having like a theme park. And you make money at the theme park. You can't duplicate this digitally. I said, exactly. If you walk around with a camera, and you're going to upload this to YouTube, someone watching that does not get the experience of being at Universal Studios. Okay? They need to go there and pay that $80 ticket plus $15 in parking, which blew me away that that's how much it was, to go to Universal Studios to experience this. And they want to. And the studios make money off of that experience that can't be duplicated digitally. And sell t-shirts and hats and all the supplementary goods and services that go with it. The thing is, the quality of the movie will actually have to increase for people to want to go to a theme park. Or, word of mouth, to get people to go to the theater. Most movies make all their money back in the first or second weekend. Beyond that, if they, don't, if they haven't made their money, they're probably not going to. So word of mouth on that second weekend is important, but it takes a good movie to do that. Right? Harry Potter world wouldn't exist if the movies were really bad. It had to be good movies. Right? Although, although J.K. Rowling was a pretty good author and the books were all right. So. <laughs> Second experience, Bon Jovi. Long story short, I ended up at an after-show party of the band Bon Jovi. I've been a fan since I was a kid. I had tickets in 1993, in fact, at Park West, which if you know the history of here, the canyons, it used to be called Park West, and I showed up on this hill out here where all these buildings have now been built. It used to be an outside amphitheater type thing, and they told me that John Bon Jovi had laryngitis and they couldn't do the concert. I was distraught. It was 18 years later, just in March, that I got to finally go to a John Bon Jovi concert. And I go to this thing, I'm invited to the after show party, or get together, whatever you want to call it, pizza and drinks is what it amounts to. And my wife and I are sitting there with our pizza and our drinks. And the bassist, Hugh McDonald, comes in. I'm like, oh, it's the bassist of Bon Jovi right there. And he comes up and sits down next to me like, oh, well, this is going to get really interesting, right? Because what am I thinking about? Open licensing. And what's the logical end? And oh my gosh, it's the basis of Bon Jovi right here. I'm going to be asking him his opinion about giving away digital content. <laughs> so I turned to him and said, hi, Hugh. How are you doing? I'm Preston Burton, professor at Utah State University. i got a question for you. <laughs> How do you feel about people pirating your, mu your music? How do you feel about people holding up their cell phones and recording your concert and uploading it to YouTube? It's breaking the law. Not just federal law, but international copyright law. They can't do that. And he's looking at me with a stunned face like I was speaking some foreign language. Like he had never considered this before. And he says, you're acting like we expect to make money by selling our music. Well, that's what all the labels say that the artists will be starving and not get any money if we don't buy the CDs and pay for the MP3s. I didn't say that, but I thought it. It's like, well, yeah, right? And he says, we don't expect to make any money at all selling our digital music, our MP3. We don't even plan on that. We make money at our concerts. You coming to the concert is what we make money on. And our t-shirts and our hats. And he's basically saying exactly what I wanted him to say, like I was feeding him, right? But he's saying it directly from the basis of Bon Jovi. I'm telling you, they don't plan on making money by selling the digital content. They make money by you coming to the concert. Okay? He even told me, he says, right now, and keep in mind, this is like an hour after the show, right now, the entire concert that you just went to is online somewhere in Facebook videos, YouTube videos. The whole thing is, like, if that's all you wanted was to experience the music, or to watch the concert, you can do that right now from your computer. You just watch it. It's like, no. We want you to come to the concert because you can feel the music and the smells and the excitement of everyone holding up their cell phones and what's weird now, people holding up their iPads. <laughs> right? But uh, he just explained that that's the way they think. Like, that is 
awesome. So I can share that at a conference like the Open Ed Conference. So with that, questions, thoughts, contributions, questions? I already said that one. Donation, discussion. Go ahead. So like, what about in industries where it's hard to find like that complimentary good? Because to me, it seems like Universal Studios, Bon Jovi, all they're doing is they're giving away something free so they can sell a complimentary good. It can be a marketing tool. Yeah, and I, I, I thought about that and so like, asked that. Well, what about someone who just wants to sit at home and write their poetry or their book or their music and they don't want to go to concerts and they don't want their logo and they don't even have a logo? What about them? It's like, well, at first, they're going to have to give away some content for free. At first, just to even get recognized. At first. Okay? And then as people recognize, wow, that person does good work. Okay? Then if they don't want to do the concerts and all of that, then it's, it's a pay per release kind of a thing. It's like, you know what? I'll write another song and perform another song, but I'm going to need an advance to do it. And people are willing to pay it, to pay the advance. Now, are they going to make as much money if they did concerts? No. But they can still make a living at doing it if they're good. If they're good. Okay? And that's what open licensing helps is identifying the cream, right? Of the, the, the cream rises to the top. It's the better, or rec the, the best get recognized. Okay? Other questions? Yep. When were these interviews done? Uh, I did them between 2008 and 2010. I did the phone interviews. The surveys were done before that, 2003, 5, and 9. Yep, let's go with here. I appreciate your, your qualitative uh, approach, but I would like to know a little bit more about, uh, so you got uh, answers from the MRT uh, staff. Uh, how many people would, uh, uh, would support those type of answers? I mean, uh, the cost and the benefits uh, that you recorded. Uh, if I were to interview was the... It just a few, of, a few of them recording that, or was it, was it a more general, general approach? Oh, okay. Uh, you're not talking about the, the staff of MIT or OCW, you're talking about the instructors who contributed, mm -hmm. yeah. but you, you want to know numbers. Uh, I categorized all the qualitative data I got, which I would say, if, if there was nothing, like just no response to the surveys, then it, it didn't get categorized. And there was, quite frankly, a lot of no responses to the surveys, there's nothing point. Uh, but if they responded with some of these quotes I could use, then I coded them. Uh, so I would say that's representative of maybe, uh, if, if you looked, if you took out the no responses, I'd say 90%, there'd be no response. They just didn't answer the question. 90. 90, yeah. So this would be 10% of those who answered the question. Yeah. And then I follow up with the, with the interviews, uh, the phone interviews on, uh, on, because I had to work with the MIT OCW evaluation team. I couldn't contact them directly. I agreed to that ahead of time and IRB approved it. So, so I worked with the MIT OCW evaluation team. They contacted the instructors directly, and then I did the, f the phone interview with one of the evaluation team members on the line. So they, not, not really vetting, but so that they could know that I wasn't doing anything that they wouldn't agree to. I, it ended up being fine, there was no problems. Uh, but I did have to work with the evaluation team to get access to the instructors. And they had their reasons, they're very valid reasons for that. And there are seven benefits they, they that uh, in, 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 uh, in the sequence of priority, or is it just... Oh, it is, I, I yes, in order of priority, okay. yeah. So the working with the MIT OCW team benefit and cost was the lowest. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what, what time are we looking at? It's, it's time. So let's go one more, and then we'll wrap. Um, this is, you know, the last one. <laughs> yeah. You want to hang around and talk, I'm okay. Um, I'm from the UK, and uh -huh. a lot of what you are say here there's that stuff that we're going in there as well. One of the things, though, that you didn't mention, you mentioned it as an advantage, but I've heard it mentioned as both an advantage and disadvantage, is the fan mail. Because is the fan mail? The fan mail. For instance, you talk about it as networking, it's positive, but it's not only you know, the kind of people who you want to engage in emails with. There's a sort of pressure building with some of the um, Oxford iTunes U stars, for instance, that they're getting so much so many queries, etc., and they feel like they have to spend a lot of time answering them. Yeah. Did that come out at all in the research? Because you don't mention it. And that's an interesting point, and I hadn't um, really come up with an answer to that other than I would say this is MIT or CW, the first one. They were early, 
Uh, and, and I got a cross section. I did a third, a third, and a third of those that were in the first two years, those that were in the middle two years, those were the kind of within the last two years. Uh, so I had a cross section of early adopters versus later adopters. Uh, but no, they didn't mention a fan mail phenomenon. <laughs> I'm getting contacted by a bunch of people that I don't want to be contacted. And that, that's, that's a fair, that's a fair uh, point. Uh, I mean, I know some people who love that. They, yeah. they absolutely love that. Yeah. And if, if you abhor such a thing, you probably shouldn't put your materials out there in an open environment. Uh, and, and there were some interesting points of, uh, from the different perspectives of those that were advanced in their careers, those that were new in their the ones that were new in their careers wanted to be discovered. The ones that were advanced wanted to leave a legacy. Like, I've spent 30, 40 years doing this. I just want to leave a legacy. So, but they all recognized that by doing, this is my opinion here, they all recognized that by doing it, they were putting themselves out there. And that might be a result, although that specific thing wasn't, wasn't mentioned. Okay, well, thank you.